passage this morning, there's some things that we've all been caught doing something in our life that we shouldn't have been doing. We've all been caught at one time or another doing something we ought not to have, have done. And most of that, most of those times are when we're children. We're caught by mom or dad or grandma or grandpa doing something we ought not to be doing. I remember growing up there in Cedar Edge. It's not Cedar Edge. It's one word, Cedar Edge. You know, we're all the way through again. <laughs> These Okies, you know. <laughs> I remember growing up in Cedar Edge, and we'd have this uh, glass cookie jar. It was glass. It was clear. You could see right through it. And we had, it was probably, you know, back when I was a kid, it seemed like it was two foot tall, but I, it's probably really only about a foot, foot and a half tall. It was glass. It had a big old glass lid on it, and every time you pulled that lid off, it'd make a ringing sound like glass does. Ring! And it would alert everybody in the house that the cookie jar had just been opened. And oftentimes on Sunday afternoon, that was the only time that my mom and dad would lay down for a nap. It seemed like to me, it was the only time, the only time they'd lay down during the middle of the day was to take a nap on Sunday afternoon. And, but me and uh, my sister, we would sometimes just get very restless, staying in our rooms. We always had to be quiet, and if we weren't quiet, they'd come after us. Uh, so we ended up growing up much of our time in Aunt Florence's house on Sunday afternoons. But there when, we were, when Aunt Florence wasn't available or when we were just at home on a Sunday afternoon, I'd try to sneak up the stairs. We had a, a tri-level house. You know, had a basement, mid-level, and top level. On the top level was the kitchen and mom and dad's bedroom. Guess where the cookies are? Not in the bedroom. It was in the kitchen. In the kitchen. So we'd climb up to the top of the stairs very quietly. It would take me probably five to ten minutes to swipe a cookie because I was being very, very quiet on the stairs. You don't walk up the center of the stairs. You walk up on the edges because the center had nailed in a very creaky. And so you walk up the edges of the stairs to get to the top of the banister, and you know where all the creaky spots are on the floor. So you always stay close to the edges and worm your way into the kitchen because mom and dad's bedroom was right there, and they're taking a nap on a Sunday afternoon, and their door is always open. The door to the bedroom is usually always open. I think they left it open for a reason, just to try to catch the rat that was stealing all their cookies. And so I'd come up to the cookie jar, and I finally figured out that if I put my fingers on the rim there and kind of give it a little bit of a gap, I could then lift that lid straight up without making that ringing noise. And then I'd bury my hand in that cookie jar all the way up to the elbow and try to wrestle around for one of them cookies at the bottom. And we had those nasty, remember the Hydrox cookies? That's what we had. We never had Oreos. When I first time I had an Oreo, that was like a privilege. We never bought Oreos. We bought Hydro. I mean, anything that was, you have the great value brand that says Hydrox. I mean, that didn't even sound healthy. That didn't even sound good. It sounds like chemical cookie. Then Hydrox. Anything with ox in it, you know, oxide, oxygen, Hydrox. It just doesn't sound good. But that's all we had, and that's what that's what Mom would always buy for us. We had Hydrox cookies, little chocolate Hydrox. Cookies with some kind of a chemical cream stuffed through the middle. I got real good lifting that lid off, getting that cookie out. But one time, one time, there was a slight ring. I didn't quite pull it off in time. And Dad came out. What are you doing? You get caught with your hand in the cookie jar, and there's not anything you can say. There's nothing you can say. You can't say I was just helping with the dishes. It just, <clears throat> there's nothing you can say that's going to paste over. I was caught doing something I shouldn't have been doing. I never went for the Debbie cakes. We did occasionally have oatmeal cream pies, but the plastic cellophane on there would be so crinkly and loud. You know that everybody in the house would hear the cellophane. So I could never get those, but I get the Hydrox cookies. I was caught doing something I shouldn't have been doing. You guys, uh, when I was a kid, I also collected either buttons or stickers. And I remember this, this button or sticker, I can't remember which. When I was a kid, it had a little cartoon tiger on it. It says, I was caught being good. You guys ever seen that little cartoon tiger? It says, I was caught being good. No, it's just me. I was the only one that had the sticker. But I was caught being good. And that's not something that I was usually caught being. But there's a story about these three Hebrews here in the book of Daniel, they were caught. They were caught standing up. Daniel chapter 3, if you're there, say amen. amen. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 to get started. It said, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high. That's high. Nine feet wide. 
and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So all of these guys assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of, the, of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. <laughs> Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. We'll stop there for now as we talk about this message. But let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And as we continue to traverse through these scriptures today, may we continue to understand what it is to be people of God, to be people of God that are going to be caught standing up when all the music is playing. Lord God, I continue to ask for your grace and your mercy today. God, that my thoughts would not be, be my own, but they'd be yours. God, again, that you take my stutter and my stammer, that I'd be able to speak clearly and concisely to your people this morning. God, I'm not a worthy servant. God, but I am willing today to share your word. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for your mercies. We are so blessed to be here in Delta County. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of that ser uh, the sermon this morning is Caught Standing Up. Caught Standing Up. First thing I want to talk about this morning is there was a tune of the times. Nebuchadnezzar put up his great big band. They put together all of these musicians. The musicians did not have to bow because they had to play. But the music was what signaled the time and the season to bow, to, to fold in half before this image. And this image was an idol that was made 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. The Bible doesn't tell us that it was an image of a man. It just says an image. Now, we have always taken it to be an image of a man, a statue of a man, and there's a lot of good evidence for that. That, that ratio of 9 to 1 continues to suggest that it may have been a man. Also, when you consider the previous chapter in, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a, had a dream, right? What was that dream about? It was a dream about a statue. And he had, he had Daniel come in to interpret that. Nobody else could interpret it, and God gave Daniel the interpretation to that dream. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, in that statue, had a head of gold, you know, had a chest and arms of silver, had a, a belly and arms of, um, of iron, and iron and clay, and so on and so forth. And he told Nebuchadnezzar specifically, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. And that kind of really blessed Nebuchadnezzar's little heart, you know. He says, if I'm going to be the head of anything, I'm going to be a head of gold. He got excited, but he totally forgot about what Daniel was talking about when a giant boulder came down and smashed that statue to pieces, all of it, including the head of gold. And so some people believe that Nebuchadnezzar was trying to self-fulfill the prophecy that Daniel had given him, that if he had this dream interpreted by a man of God, that he was the head of gold, then very much so he and his ego needed to have a statue of gold in his image. And so that's supposition, but that is a good description of chapter 2. Now we're in chapter 3 where he is creating this entire image of gold likely an image of himself. It was set up there on the plain of Dura. It was right there, right there at the front doorstep of the city of Babylon. You're not going to set up an image out in the middle of the countryside when everybody can't see it. You're going to set it up there close to the front gate of the city so that everybody that comes to your city is going to see it. His ego was such that he had to have that there near the city. Everybody was going to look at that. It was a symbol of power for all those entering the city, something that is 90 feet tall. That's tall. But there was a problem with the Jewish people there in the city of Babylon is that God had instructed the Jewish people that they could not worship any graven image or any other god. That's a part of the Ten Commandments. Many of us know the Ten Commandments there in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 5 says this, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God loves his people. 
And God is jealous when we are lured away by the things of this world, when we bow down and give worship to anything else that is in this world. God is a jealous God. Just as with any of you that have wives and husbands, you are jealous of their love. You don't want them to be distracted by any other man or any other woman. You're very jealous for their love. You want them to, to stay near to you. And God is the same with his people. He desires his people to stay near to him. And he gave the conscription, do not bow down to graven images and worship them. So this event was coming down the pike and it was something about to transpire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not unaware of this. They knew what was going to happen. They knew that this was going to be a dedication, but they had hoped that he wasn't going to make them bow down. You could show up to a dedication. You could show up to this image being dedicated, but as a Jewish individual, you could not be a part of something that was going to be consecrated. A spiritual moment something that was be mandated to be worshipped. So this event was, was likely a loyalty oath to Nebuchadnezzar, which again further supports the notion that this idol was possibly in his image. Now the Jewish people were loyal. They were loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. They were loyal to the government, but they were just not that loyal. They were not loyal enough to worship a graven image that God's word had clearly condemned. Friends, we are all loyal Americans. We're just not loyal enough to go along with what the culture is demanding that we bow to. The tune of the times. The tune of the times. When the tune of the times began to play, most people had no qualms about bowing down. Their faith was in Nebuchadnezzar, especially when death was a penalty. It's not hard to have faith and trust in somebody, especially when they tell you that you're going to be executed if you don't. That's a great sign of a person or of a man's insecurity. If you have to tell people to bow down to your image, otherwise they're going to be killed, that you are a very insecure man. What was it that Nebuchadnezzar used to signal this bowing down? He used music. He used music, he used all of the instruments of the day, he used all the instruments of his time to require people to bow. It was a tune of terror. Friends, the world plays its music and lulls the masses to sleep. There are some governors today in America that do not want you to worship God with music. But if it's the governor's music that they're playing, then that's okay. Friends, the tune of the times has been playing for many millennia, from one generation to another. It's a sound that transfixes the weak into submission, and it causes the masses to turn a blind eye for standing for what is right. The band in America has been singing through the verse for quite some time, but the tune of the times has now just entered the chorus. Very few people know verses of hymns, but most all of us know the chorus. It is the rendition that is most often crescendoed upon. It is the words that are so quickly upon our lips and upon our heart. But this tune of the times now has continued to enter the chorus here in America. Trying times. Secondly, this morning is standing tall. You look there in your scriptures, verse 7. It says, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of all of those instruments, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Neb had set up. And at this time, some astrologers, good old stargazers, at this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of all these instruments must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Ooh, that's not good. These men, these three men, were Babylonian administrators. They were bosses. The Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar called together all the leaders. He didn't call all the common people. The regular citizens, they are not mentioned as being there. Who was called to come to the dedication service? All the bosses, 
all the administrators, all the satraps, all the governors. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were administrators of some sort. They were leaders. They were boss men. These three Hebrew men had been faithful to their new country. You remember that they were kidnapped. They were taken as hostages. They were taken as, as maybe refugees, forcibly taken out of Jerusalem and brought over to Babylon and then immediately put into Babylonian schools and then elevated to positions of leadership. They're not in the, in the extending uh, regions, not in the extending states, but they're in the capital city. They were bosses in the capital. They had been faithful. These men had been faithful to their new country. Even though they were Jewish nobility and princes, they were still faithful. Chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that these men were officials there in the city of Babylon. These were men that had lost everything. They had lost everything. They had lost families. They had lost wealth being being officials and noblemen there in, in Jerusalem. They had had everything ripped from their hands. They had watched their city be burned to ashes. They had watched it being burned to ground. They had lost everything. Now the season of time had come around, full circle, and now they had gained everything back. They had positions of power. They had positions of influence. They were perhaps accruing wealth once again as being boss men. And now they had, they had everything to lose once more. They had lost everything, they had gained everything back, and now they were looking at losing everything again. These three Hebrews, these three Jewish men, they wore Babylonian clothes. They didn't wear Jewish clothes. They wore, they, they wore Babylonian clothes. They were cultured in Babylonian ways. They went to Babylonian university. They were educated in those Babylonian schools. They knew how to play Babylonian football. They played the sports there. They knew how to do it all. But there's always something to be said, an old adage that we have here in America. You can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. They may look like Babylonians. They may smell like Babylonians. They may know Babylonian ways and culture and the words of way, and ways to say them. But they still had God in their heart. They still served Jehovah. You could take the boy out of Jerusalem, but their identity was not in Jerusalem. Their identity was with the Lord. Their identity was with God. But there comes a time in everybody's life where that culture that you have adopted, that you have enjoyed, there comes a time when that culture comes into conflict with God's word and there thus presents a problem. They had to make a split decision. Even though they were bosses, they probably did not know all that was about to transpire that morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been called to this business meeting. They had been called to this dedication. A time had been set, a date had been set on the calendar, and they knew it, they were prepared for it, and they hoped that it was just a dedication and not a worship service. But here they still got up in the morning and they still went. They had kissed their wives and their children that morning on the way to work. They had kissed them goodbye, not knowing what the day might hold for them. They had no time to think. They had no time to confer with each other. This was the day that the faith of these men would be tested. Was their faith real? Friends, I'll tell you, faith is not real until it is tested. A lot of people's faith is being tested right now. There are many that are coming to the faith right now. There are some, there are a few that are falling from the faith right now. But faith is not real until it is tested. And as those three men, they stood there together, rigid in their resolve to do what was right, their families continued to pass before their minds, knowing that their kids could be orphans the next day. But they would not They would not bow, knowing that they may condemn their wives and their children to poverty, if not death itself. These three men chose to stand together. These three men stood together there on that plain of Dura. They did not stand alone. Friends, there is strength in numbers, even if the numbers are few. 
The Bible tells us where two or more are gathered, there I am among them. There is strength in numbers. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing even better than that because they had three. There's strength in numbers. There's also courage in numbers. If you're standing by yourself, there's every temptation in the world just to bow down with everybody else. If everybody to your left and to your right, if everybody in front of you and behind you is bowing down, you don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. So much pressure to bow. But there's courage in numbers. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they refused to bow, they stood together. They could see each other. They could essentially stand arm in arm knowing the decisions that they would make at that moment in time may very well cost them their life because the death sentence had already been issued. Anybody who does not bow will be cast into the fiery furnace. Anybody who does not bow is going to die one of the most horrible deaths known to mankind, to be burned alive. They already knew how it was going to happen. They knew when it was going to happen. And yet they stood. And yet they stood. Friends, there's strength in numbers, there's courage in numbers, there's also comfort in numbers. Knowing that they were going to die or God was going to rescue them, one or the other, they took comfort in knowing that they weren't going alone. They took comfort in knowing that any suffering that they would have to endure would also be shared with their brothers. The like-minded brothers. Friends, we are blessed here in America. We don't have just three people believing. Friends, we don't even have the 300 people that are gathered here with this church. There's more than 3,000. There's more than 30,000. There's more than tens of thousands here in America, friends. There are millions of people standing here before the image of the world and we're refusing to bow. Millions upon millions of believers. Sometimes we get depressed about what's going on around us. But friends, we ought to take courage, strength, and comfort in knowing that there are millions who have not bowed. So thirdly, today, we're going to continue to stand firm. Continuing to stand firm there in verse 16. They would not bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Oh, that we would have such great faith and courage today. Friends, when you don't bow down to the things of this world, you don't fit in. That's one thing that we as believers and Christians do well, is we don't fit in real well. When everyone else folded at the waist, they did not, because they continued to choose to stand firm. Those three statements that Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, they said, we, first of all, do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. O King Nebuchadnezzar, we honor you as our king, as our leader. We've been faithful to you. We've been faithful to this country. But we answer to God, not to man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they not do? They did not yell and scream. They did not throw a fit. They didn't go up to the base of that statue and throw ropes around it and try to pull it down. They stood their ground. They did not throw a fit. Why? Because they represented the people of God before the king. If you're going to impress kings, then you stand your ground and you stand for what you believe in. You don't throw a fit. These men understood that they served a higher power, that they served a greater king, and they served the most powerful judge. They went on again to say, God is able to save and he will rescue us. They acknowledged God's ability. They displayed faith in an unseen God. That's what faith is. Believing that which is not seen. But friends, you and I, we sense his presence every day. God is able to save and he will rescue us. 
Such a bold proclamation of faith. Friends, what we need today in the American church is a sense and a taste of boldness. But third and finally, they acknowledged the reality of their situation. The reality was that if God does not save us, we're still not going to worship you or your gods. We're still not going to bow. Even if God doesn't save us, they are realistic. They proclaimed with faith, but they also proclaimed with realism, with the realisticness. So many people today in the faith community says you can't say anything about reality and realism because that's giving place to them. That's giving place to evil. That's giving place to the demonic. No, friends, it's okay to acknowledge the power and sovereignty of Almighty God, and it's okay to also recognize the realisticness of the situation is God may not spare us, but if he doesn't spare me from this cancer, from the sickness, from persecutions, I'm still not going to bow. Friends, these three men acknowledged God's sovereign will in the matter. Friends, we're all going to die of something sometime. We're all going to pass away from something at some time. God is not going to deliver you each and every time of sickness. God's not going to deliver you of each and every type of persecution. He may deliver you some, but he's not, he never, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all died. They died of something. They died of old age. And that's going to be caused by something. God is able to save and he will rescue us, but it continues to align itself with the sovereign will of God. Sometimes God's sovereign will for your life is to traverse through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes God's sovereign will for you is to go through hard times and seasons. Sometimes God's sovereign will for your life is to go through the struggle of sickness so that you are in a position to pray for these nurses that are scared out of their mind right now there in the hospital. Sometimes God's will for you, his sovereign will, might be for you to make a visit to the ER so you can pray with a doctor who is needing to hear some hope. If God does not save us, we're still not going to worship you or your gods. That king even gave them a second chance. He wanted to be hospitable. He wanted everybody to bow down to him. But they did not need a second chance. As believers in Almighty God, as worshipers of Jesus Christ, we don't need a second chance. He says, I want to give you a second thing to do the right, a second chance to do the right thing. What was it? Those three men said, King, we're already doing the right thing. We don't need a second chance. We're telling you right here, right now, O oh King, we ain't bowing. We ain't bowing. So Nebuchadnezzar lost his ever loving mind. He ordered the fire there at the furnace to be, become seven times hotter. Friends, you need to understand that things in life make it a heck of a lot harder for you before they get better. Things may get hotter for us as believers before they get cooler. Friends, if things are getting hotter, that means the, you're doing the right thing. That means the world's ticked off. If things are getting a little bit hotter, then you're in the right place. And then what did he do? Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to be bound, bound with ropes there behind their backs. Friends, you need to understand as believers, the world may try to tie you up in knots. The world may try to bind you and restrict your freedoms, take away your freedoms, but we will walk with God in the fire. We're going to walk with God in the fire. And after those three men were thrown into the fire, what was the exclamation that Nebuchadnezzar made there in verse 25. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Wow. Even from the mouth of babes, spiritual babes, the fourth looks like a son of the gods. In his pagan, ungodly mind, he didn't know Jesus when he saw him. They walked with God in the fire and they praised God while in the fire. Friends, the fires of this world can't touch your soul when you're standing with God. That fire brought freedom because their restraints were burned off. That fire brought liberty because their captors perished. The people that threw them in, it was so hot they died on the spot. Friends, what you think might be the end might be your salvation and your promotion. Verse 30 continues to conclude. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. 
Friends, the fires of this life lead to promotion. The fire going through the fire will lead to promotion. Either you are promoted to the presence of God, which is the greatest promotion of all time, or you're promoted in the lesser ways of men for greater influence among men. When you walk with God, you can't help but be promoted. You may not be promoted by your earthly boss, but in the kingdom of God, you've just taken a huge step up the corporate kingdom ladder. But friends, it might mean you have to walk through the fire. You have to walk through the fire. Would you stand with me this morning as we conclude? Whew, that was good stuff today. That was fun. Friends, I don't know. I don't know the fires that you're individually being marched towards today. Individually, there are many people here today that are going towards fires of some sort. Going to the fires of a intimidating doctor's office and the intimidating report. Some are being marched towards the fires of financial ruin. Some are being marched towards the fires of working with employees and employers and being put out by that. Friends, I don't know what fires are that you're individually being marched towards, but I do see the fires of this country being stoked. I do see the passions of this nation being lit up and they're fanning into flame. Friends, the suffering of our country is not something that we as believers have desired nor asked for. We don't want this mess. We don't want to have to deal with this mess. And sometimes that music of the world begins to, begins to, to play and some people in the believing community are now debating whether or not to bow or to stand. Things are being ratcheted up. But friend, as we as believers choose to stand, we know that we will not stand alone. We have people to our left and people to our right, people in front of us that are going to stand. Friend, if you, friend, if you, if you stand for God, then you will stand with God. Friends, those fires will have no effect. Those fires that you have so feared will bring God glory through your trial. Friends, promotion is just on the other side of the flame. You may not have wanted to be promoted that way, but God's will is sovereign. And if that's what God's will calls for us, then we will be faithful. And we will stand when it seems like everyone else folds. We will stand.